Good night. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our amphibians late night. Um, we're going to start off our night with some trivia, then we'll do some crafts. And then we have a guest speaker who's going to be talking about amphibians. So uh, exciting night. So Rhea, you want to get us started on trivia? Yes, I will. Thank you, Lauren. So welcome everybody to amphibians trivia. So your first thing that you can do is you can scan this QR code or you can go to menti.com and you can enter this code, this eight digit code down here. So I'll give you guys a minute to join. Go ahead and scan that code or join menti.com and enter that eight digit code. And your first question is coming up right now. Number one, what does the name amphibian mean? A, fast swimmer. B, living a double life. C, green animal. Or D, jumping onto land. Okay, we have answers starting to come in. Not many, oh, we've got some more coming in. Just three, and we have an even split between A, B, and D at the moment. Maybe something else will come in. I don't see anyone else answering right now. So we have a split between A, B, and D. Okay, so the correct answer is B, living a double life. This name comes from amphibians' ability to live both in the water and on land. So nice job, everyone. The next question is number two. Which of the following is not a trait of amphibians? A, having a backbone. B, hibernation. C, being warm-blooded. Or D, living both on land and in water. Okay, let's see, we've got answers for B right now. Um, oh, now we've got B and C. Let's give another minute, another couple seconds. Still an even split between B and C. Okay, so let's find out the correct answer is C, being warm blooded. Amphibians are cold blooded animals, meaning that they cannot control their own body temperature. If they get too hot or too cold, they have to move to a different place to catch the sun or shade. Next question Which of these animals is not a type of amphibian? A, frogs. B, salamanders. C, Sicilians or D, snakes? All right, waiting for some answers to come in. Oh, we've got some answers for D. And nope, still, still answers for D. Okay, so the correct answer is D, snakes. Along with alligators, crocodiles, turtles, and lizards, snakes are reptiles, not amphibians. Question number four, where do most amphibians live? A, in the ocean. B, dry, hot areas like deserts. C, warm, wet environments like swamps. Or D, snowy areas. All right, we've got several answers for C. No, no other answers yet, just all everyone's saying C. Okay, so the correct answer, are you ready for the correct answer, Lauren? Yes, we are. Okay, so the correct answer is actually C, warm, wet environments like swamps. While some amphibians can live in deserts or snowy areas, most live in warm, wet environments. Question five, 
How many species of amphibians have been discovered? A, 60, B, 600, C, 6,000, or D, 60,000? All right, we've got some more answers coming in. We've got uh, answers for B and C. What? Most people are saying C right now. Okay, so the correct answer is C, 6,000. So of that 6,000 known amphibian species, only about 300 live in the U.S. Okay, and if you are just joining us now, uh, you can go ahead and scan that QR code. We are playing Amphibians Trivia. You can also join the website menti.com and enter that eight digit code. You can also put your answers in the chat like some, some of you are doing that. That is fine too. Just keep track of what you're getting right. Okay, so the next question. What part of their bodies can amphibians use to breathe? A, eyes, B, feet, C, tongues, or D, skin? All right, it looks like we've got some more people joining us. The numbers of answers are going up, that's great. Uh, so we've got answers for C and D right now, but most people are saying D. Let's get okay. Them a minute another se couple seconds yeah no change c and d but most people saying d okay so let's find out so yes the correct answer is d uh skin while all amphibians use their skin to help them breathe some have totally lost their lungs through the process of evolution and can only breathe through their skin and here's a picture, uh, you can see the difference between the reptile skin and amphibian skin. Okay, next question. Do all amphibians have gills? A, yes, as juveniles. B, yes, as adults. C, yes, some as juveniles and some as adults. Or D, no, amphibians do not have gills. Okay, this is really split. We've got A, C, and D right now. Let's see if we can get some more tiebreakers coming in. Still A, C, and D, slightly more for C. Oh, here comes some more answers for C. Okay, let's find out. So the correct answer is C. Yes, some as juveniles and some as adults. Whether only as larvae or as adults, all amphibians have gills at some point in their life cycle. Seems like our audience knows a lot about amphibians tonight. All right, next question. Where do most amphibians lay their eggs? A, in the water, B, inside logs, C, in the sand, or D, on top of leaves? All right, let's see, we've got answers for A and D, uh, but more answers are coming in for letter A. Oh, yep, overwhelmingly picking letter A. Okay, let's see. So the correct answer is A, in the water. Because amphibian eggs do not have protective shells, they must be laid in water or a damp environment to keep them from drying out. Question number nine. Why are some amphibians very brightly colored? A, to attract mates. B, to warn predators that they are poisonous. C, to hide from predators. Or D, to absorb more oxygen through their skin. All right, we've got split between A, B, and C right now. Let's see if some more tiebreakers can come in. What? Oh, okay, now it's, most people are saying uh, B for their answer. Okay, 
So the correct answer is B, to warn predators that they are poisonous. Poison dart frogs are a good example of amphib amphibians with bright warning coloration. And scientists think that they get their poisons from the insects that they eat. Number 10, which of these animals is the largest living amphibian? A, Chinese giant salamander. B, goliath frog. C, purple frog, or a D, Kahansi spray toad? All right, we've got answers for A, B, and D right now. Tag with A. We've got split between A and D. It's dead even between those two answers right now. Okay, so let's find out. It is A, the Chinese giant salamander. The largest amphibian in the world is the Chinese giant salamander, which can reach up to six feet in length. That is taller than me. That's really big. All right, so once again, if you are just joining us uh, for Amphibians Trivia, you go ahead and scan that QR code. Um, you can also just type in menti.com and you can enter in that eight digit code on the screen. Um, or your third option is you can just um, play by submitting your answers in the chat and just keep, make sure you're keeping track of your scores. Right? Either way, any of these options. Okay, so the next question. How big is the world's smallest frog? A, less than half inch. B, half an inch, C, one inch, or D, two inches? All right, we've got overwhelmingly people picking letter A for this, and one person for B. Okay, so let's see. That is correct, A, less than half an inch. The smallest amphibian is a frog. I'm going to try to say this. Um, Pedophrine amanuensis that measures only 0 0.3 inches long. It's pretty small. All right, oh, next. The cutest frog I've ever seen on the. <laughs> <laughs> very <laughs> cute, so yes. Cute. <laughs> oh, yeah, I didn't realize it's a picture of a dime. Yeah, so that is very, very cute. All right, next question. Which type of amphibian has no limbs? A, frogs, B, salamanders, C, Sicilians, or D, none of the above? Can you check the answers? Let's see, I'm very glad you were reading this because I did not know how to pronounce the letter C. <laughs> but we have answers for B, C, and D. Uh, most people are picking C or D at the moment. Okay. And now we have more people picking letter C. Is more for C. Popular? Okay. Okay, let's let's find let's let's see. <laughs> All right. The correct answer is C. Sicilians are a group of legless worm-like amphibians that usually live underground in parts of South America, Africa, and Southern Asia. It's an interesting looking thing. All right. So next question. I think it looks more like an insect than an amphibian, like a worm. Right, I would, yeah. I would guess that that was an amphibian. <laughs> I, I would not either. <laughs> All right, next question. A newt is a type of A, frog, B, salamander, C, reptile, or D, toad? All right, we have answers coming in for B and D. But most people are picking C. Yep. Lots more coming in for, I'm sorry, not for C, for B. Letter B is what most people are picking right now. Okay, let's, let's find out. So that's correct, B, salamander. The word newt refers to a particular group of aquatic salamanders. So all newts are salamanders, but not all salamanders are newts. 
Okay, question number 14. Which is the only type of amphibian to have tentacles? A, salamanders, B, frogs, C, Sicilians, or D, none of the above? Let's see, we have answers for C and D right now. Not many answers yet. I think people are waiting to see what the answers. I chose D. <laughs> yeah, Cassie's Bless playing uh, trivia along with us. Uh, most people are saying <laughs> D right now. Okay, so let's find out. The correct answer is actually C, Sicilians. They have tiny tentacles located on their heads between their eyes and nostrils. I did not know that. That is very interesting. And that's a very interesting close-up picture too. All right, next question, number 15. What is the difference between a frog and a toad? A, toads have bumpy skin. B, toads have shorter legs. C, toads don't always need to stay near water. Or is it D, all of the above? All right, let's see. Most people are picking D right now. We only have answers uh, for letter D at the moment. Okay. Oh, and there goes one for B, but still most people are saying D. Okay, let's 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 see what the correct answer is. And it is D, all of the above. Toads have bumpier skin, longer legs, and don't always need to stay near water. And it is just a myth that touching a toad will give you warts. I actually didn't think I actually heard that myth before, but now I now I know. All right. So once again, if you are just joining us for our trivia, we are doing amphibians tonight. And you can scan that QR code to join, or you can uh, go to menti.com and enter in your eight-digit code that's on the screen. Um, and make sure you're keeping track of your scores so that you can find out how you did at the end of this. Number 16, what is a group of frogs called? A, an army. B, a squad. C, a herd or a D, a flock? This is a tr fact that I did not know the answer to. Either. I actually, I don't know either actually. I only know because I read the questions ahead of time, but I didn't know before that. We have answers for A, B, and D right now. Slightly more for A. Let's give it another, oh, some more answers are coming in for A. That's, that's the majority now. Clay agrees with them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's find out. What, what do you call a group of frogs? An army. While a group of frogs is called an army, a group of toads is called a knot. Sounds kind of scary that an, an army of frogs are, are, you know, walking around <laughs> or hopping around, I guess. But that's pretty cool. All right, next question. Number 17. What is the name of the process where frogs change from tadpoles into adult frogs? A, budding. B, alternation. C, metamorphosis. Or D, of viviparity. Okay, we have lots of answers coming in. All for letter C, oh, one for letter B, but overwhelmingly letter C. Okay, so the correct answer is C, metamorphosis. Some insects also go through a type of metamorphosis like caterpillars, but amphibians are the only animals with backbones that can do this. And there's the the sequence of, of how that happens here. Okay, next question. Which of the following is a method used by male frogs to attract females? A, whistling, B, purring, C, winking, or D, croaking? Okay, 
Okay, I have a couple answers coming in. D. All for letter D right now, as Cassie says. She's looking at the results with me. <laughs> All right, guess. <Cassie. laughs> I have my own army of children playing along here with me. <laughs> and I play doodle. Yeah. I okay, so let's see. You guys said D, so let's find out. And that is correct. Croaking is most often used as a way for males to attract mates. But some frogs also croak to defend their territory or to warn others of danger. All right, next question. What is the current record for the longest lived amphibian? A, 12 years, B, 25 years, C, 56 years, or D, 70 years? All right, we've got people guessing C and D right now, uh, but most people are picking letter C. Give it another couple seconds up. Some more answers for D. The majority are still saying C, 56 years. Okay, so let's find out. And the correct answer is D, 70 years. The longest living amphibian is likely the Ulm. Individuals have been kept in captivity for over 70 years, and the predicted maximum lifespan is over a century. It's pretty cool. And the last question, I think, this is, why are many species of amphibian in decline? A, pollution. B, hunting by humans. Or C, too many predators, or D, none of the above. All right, we have answers coming in. People saying A, uh, a and D, but majority of people are saying A right now. Oh, some uh. more for D, but still more for A. Four. Okay. So let's see what the correct answer is. And it is A, pollution. Since amphibians breathe through their skin, they are very sensitive to air and water pollution. And this is a major cause of their recent decline. All right, so that was our amphibians trivia. So thank you for playing. Let's see how many questions you got right. If you got zero to 10 questions correct, you are a conservationist. If you got 11 to 15 correct, you are an amphibian enthusiast. And if you got 16 to 20 questions correct, you are a herpetologist. So go ahead and count your, see how much your numbers are. And you can give yourselves a pat on the back or a clap for yourselves. And you can name yourself one of these three things. So thank you for playing everybody. Oh, Lauren, out of curiosity, how many? Did uh, Cassie get right? Uh, well, she was sort of cheating because she was seeing what other people were answering because I was okay. at the results and so she'd pick what they were picking. So, <laughs> I'm trying to explain to her, you don't always cheat off the person next to you because you're assuming that they know more than you, right? So, <laughs> so we don't really have an accurate number. <laughs> All right. All right, so thanks everybody for playing Amphibian Trivia. The next thing we have are is actually frog crafts with me so um we will be making right now the toilet paper roll frog um and so for that what the supplies if you want to go grab them are a toilet paper roll um you can get red and green construction paper if you have black and green markers or crayons you can get a stapler glue and scissors I actually did not have any empty toilet paper rolls. So I'm actually just going to show you how to use um, just construction paper to do this. So here's a sample I made earlier. And I'll stop sharing and show this to you too. Um, so you can see it's totally possible if you don't have all the supplies listed here, you can make it without whatever is here. Um, I also did not have red construction paper, so I actually colored the tongue and I'll show you how to do that too. Um, and so I'll give you guys a second to do that. If you want to make the paper plate frog, um, 
you can see on the picture, it's pretty simple. I can, all you have to do is color a paper, the back of the paper plate. Uh, you can, you know, give it eyes and a mouth and you can give it a tongue and you can either glue or staple. Um, you're just gonna trace your hand on a paper and you're gonna cut that out. So you can see that's the leg. So that's very simple if you wanna make that paper plate frog. Uh, right now, what I'm gonna show you how to do is making this, this paper roll frog, okay? So I'm going to stop sharing this so that you can see the video better. Okay, so here's the sample that I made earlier. You know, hold it this way. So you can see here are the legs. Here's the tongue, a little smile. And I had two, I had googly eyes, so I put two googly eyes. But if you don't have googly eyes, no worries. You can make your own eyes, okay? So what I'm gonna do actually first is I'm going to make this roll part. So if you're making it out of construction paper, you can follow my instructions. If you have a toilet paper roll, you can just start coloring that green or any color you want, because we saw that frogs can be different colors. So you can definitely start coloring your roll if you already have it. And if you don't have a roll, you can follow the instructions I'm showing you. So I think I want it to be this much. So I'm gonna cut that. Okay, so I cut it and I'm gonna roll it up now. And I actually have some tape at this point, if you have scissors or if you wanna use glue, that's, that's really up to you. I am gonna use some tape for this. Okay, I'm getting that tape on. And again, if you already have your roll made, you can go ahead and start coloring or painting that even if you want to paint, you can even paint it. Okay, so this is kind of like the frog's body. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna make the frog's legs. So how to do that is I'm actually gonna make, cut out some strips of paper. So long, the long side, you want them to be pretty long. And I might even have to, to glue some together so, or tape them together, let's see how long it turns out. So yeah, I think I'm gonna make mine longer. So I'm gonna make some more strips.
All right, and then for the ends of these legs, I'm gonna make the little feet. And I think I'm gonna draw that so that I can cut it out. Make a little foot like that. Now I'll cut this out. And once you finish making your frog, I will show you guys where you can post it, but please post them to our Padlet page so that we can see all of the really nice frog, frogs that you all made. So once I'm done with this little guy, I'll show you where that is. Okay, so I just cut out one foot and I'm gonna trace that. I'm gonna cut that out, Just the other foot. Okay, so I'm also going to need tongue. So I have some markers. So I'm gonna take red marker and I'm gonna cut out a little strip here from some white paper. If you have red construction paper, that's pretty easy. Just cut out a little strip. Uh, if you don't have red construction paper, then go ahead and you can like cut a strip for your tongue. So I'm gonna make it thinner than the other one that I did. Okay, so I'm gonna color this in. That's gonna be the tongue for my frog. And you can just color like the whole thing white, uh, the whole white part red. I'm actually going to also color the other side red because we're gonna roll it up. So then you want, don't want some white spaces to be showing. So I'll just color the other side red as well. Okay, so I think I'm ready to put my frog together. So I'm just gonna tape these legs since I didn't have um, enough, it wasn't long enough. So that's why I'm taping them together. But if you just cut long strips, that's you only need two strips. I cut four because I need to make them longer, but you definitely don't have to do this. Okay, so there's one leg. Okay, so it's time to put, put it on the frog's body. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this. And I'm actually gonna just tape, tape it at the bottom right there. And if you find it easier to use glue for this, you can definitely use glue. Or if you want to use a stapler, that's fine too. 
Okay. And so the next part is pretty simple. You're just going to take the leg and fold it over like this. And I'm going to leave some extra out here because that's going to be where I glue that foot. So it looks like this. And I'm actually going to use my glue stick for this part. Oh, can you guys not hear me? I can hear you fine, Rhea. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna glue this here. Okay, so there's one leg right there. And I'm gonna fold this part. And that's gonna be my foot or not my foot, my frog's foot. And so what I'm gonna do now is actually glue here that frog foot. So you can kind of see it has that foot there. Okay, I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. Okay, and then I'm gonna fold it over. And fold this part. And glue that uh, foot. Okay, so the next thing that we can do now is actually making the face. So if you have, you want to do the eyes. Or let's, actually, I'm going to do the tongue first because I have to glue that on. So let me get some black marker. Give it a big smile. It's a happy frog. I'm actually going to give it like a really big smile. Okay, and so there's a really big smile. And so for the tongue, I'm going to roll it up a little bit. So I'm going to roll it at the end. So I rolled it up. And I'm going to glue it on. And I'm just going to stick it right out from the tongue. And I'm actually going to fold it over a little so it's sticking straight out too. That looks pretty funny. 
And I actually have googly eyes right here. So I'm gonna move some googly eyes there. And I'm just going to glue on my other frog eye here. And there you go, a friend for the other frog. And I can show it to you from the other view too. So here's the frog that we just made together. You can see its little feet. And here's its friend. So we have two frog friends here. So let's take a look at the Padlet and let's, let's see what you guys have made. So if you need that Padlet site, you can scan this QR code on the screen and that'll take you right to our Padlet page. And I can show you what that looks like. Okay, so let's see. So here are some on our Padlet. We also have the other options. If you would like to make a paper plate frog or a paper bowl frog, you can do that. Here's a frog I made earlier. And I might need to refresh this to see that is my variations here. And look at that. Okay, I see a origami frog. That is really cool. And here's another paper frog. That also looks really nice. Okay, and it it is supposed to be green. So it says hashtag green there. I see that. It's really nice. All right, so yeah, so go ahead and scan that QR code. And once you are finished making your frogs, you can please upload them so we can see your amphibian creations. And uh, so far, these look really great. I'll refresh one more time and see if there's anything else. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I think it is time for us to learn more about amphibians. Um, so today we have our guest speaker, Elena Lockett, and she will be speaking to us all about amphibians. So Lena, are you, are you ready? All right, there she is. So without further ado, everyone, uh, please enjoy this talk by Lena. Hello, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I probably will um, unshare and reshare um, so that we can do some sound uh, listening to some frogs. So let me just get that situated. All right, so uh, thank you all for coming to the late night. I'm really excited to be able to talk with you all. Like Taria said, my name is Lena. I am finishing up my PhD in the next few weeks. Um, and so the title of this talk, I, it, it's kind of funny, right? Foul and loathsome creatures, polluted habitats in New Jersey amphibians. So calling amphibians uh, foul and loathsome. So why would I do that? So uh, there's this guy named Linnaeus uh, back in the day. He wrote that these foul and loathsome animals are abhorrent because of their cold body, pale color, carlaginous skeleton, filthy skin, fierce aspect, calculating eye, offensive smell, harsh voice, squalid habitation, and terrible venom. All of those adjectives to describe frog. Um, but I don't know about you, but I actually kind of find them very intriguing and kind of cool to, to think about. And while they 
can have venom and uh, they can look a bit odd at times. I think they're worth thinking about in a little bit more detail. And if you've never heard about Linnaeus, he's the one who's responsible for you know, all the weird names of all the different animals and plants that are in our environment. So he came up with the naming system. Anyway, I thought if we were gonna talk about frogs, the first thing I should tell you about is what frogs and toads actually live in New Jersey, since that's where I'm going to assume a lot of you all are. It's where I am, it's where my research took place, it's where Rutgers is. Let's take a look. There are 18 different frogs and toads in New Jersey, so we'll start with toads. Um, so I've arranged these into different families. And so we can call the first family true toads. And we have the fun Bufanidae is the name of the family. And there's actually two different toads in this group. So on the left, we have Fowler's toad. And on the right, we have the American toad. And at first glance, you might think, wow, these look very similar. But actually, if you, if you lean in, you can actually see that there are warts in those dark patches on their back. And so American toads tend to have one, sometimes two warts in those dark circles, whereas Fowler's toads tend to have three or more warts in those dark patches. And so that's how you can um, determine which one you have caught if you find one when you're out and about. Um, also, true toads, these Bufanidae um, toads, they have what we call bufotoxins. And so basically they are poisonous frogs, um, but they're not poisonous to us. Uh, but if you were another animal that thought that they looked like a nice tasty snack, uh, you would quickly realize that they do not taste good because of that, that bufotoxin or that poison that they, they let out through their skin. So it is okay for you to touch or pick one up, but I just, I would advise you to wash your hands after touching them. But honestly, I'd advise you to wash your hands after touching any amphibian, um, but they won't hurt you. As we learned in the trivia, they won't give you warts, um, although they have them themselves. Okay, so the next group of toads is the North American spadefoot. And so um, we only have one species in this family and that's the Eastern spadefoot toad. And this, this, this type of frog is really cool because of their hind legs. They kind of have these claws that allow them to dig really well into the ground. And so toads are much more terrestrial. And so these toads actually spend most of the time underground. So they are very, very difficult to find um, because they really only come out like when it's raining and then they go back to being underground. And so if you did see one, you'd probably see them digging what would look like backwards, right? Because they're, they're digging, they're digging limbs, their, their legs are what's doing the work. And so they actually do it backwards. The next group is our tree frogs and the family name for this is Hylidae. And so there's a lot of fun um, species in this group. So I'll talk about a few of them. So um, let's see. The green tree frog up in our right hand corner is pretty interesting because it didn't used to be native in New Jersey, but with climate change, its range has expanded. So now we do find the green tree frog in New Jersey. Uh, if you're going down the road with your windows down, um, maybe a little later on this month, you will probably hear a lot of frogs. The frog that you are most likely hearing is this, the Northern Spring Peeper. They are very loud and they have these large choruses um, of singing that they do. Uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, we have two species I wanted to mention, or three species really. Um, the, the first one is the, the Pine Barrens tree frog. So this one is pretty unique because they really like acidic habitats. So uh, in kind of, I guess, central slash southern New Jersey, we have the Pine Barrens. And so that's where this species lives because there's lots of bogs and like lots of acidic habitat for them to find there. Uh, the other species that I wanted to list or talk about were the Northern Gray Tree Frog and the Cope's Gray Tree Frog. If you were to just have two of them next to each other, you wouldn't be able to visually tell the difference. So the, the difference between these two species actually is, is 
is in their genetics. So the northern gray tree frog actually has twice as many chromosomes and chromosomes are just, you know, where all of our DNA, our genetic information is held. So they have twice as, as much genetic information. And because of this, when they have their mating call, they make the same type of sound, but it's at a slower rate. So Cope's gray tree frog, it sings faster, it has half as many chromosomes, and it's actually endangered um, in the state of New Jersey. And I don't remember if I mentioned this, but the Pine Barrens tree frog is listed as threatened in New Jersey. So those are our two species that we want to make sure that we're really you know, thinking about as far as conservation is concerned, at least in this state. And then our last group, Our last group is what we would call the true frogs. And this is the group, um, the ranids. This, this is the group that I spend most of my time studying. So I've done some work with pickerel frogs. Um, so that's this guy in the bottom. I've done some work with tadpoles. We have green frogs, which are very, very common. Wood frogs, very common. Bullfrogs, they're actually, bullfrogs are actually the largest frog in North America. And, you know, in our trivia, we saw the, that giant salamander um, that was six feet. So the bullfrog really only gets to be about eight inches. So not nearly as large, but that is the largest species in this country. And then uh, I'll talk about two more frogs in this, this group um, on a, another slide, because the, the, this is the study species that I, that I focused on. Um, so these are all the frogs that you, frogs and toads that you find in New Jersey. And so you might think, okay, um, why do we care about amphibians? Well, uh, they are in decline more so than other um, categories of animals. So amphibians are declining at a much faster rate than mammals and birds and reptiles. Uh, and so that's why we want to think about them. Also, they can be indicators of what's a healthy habitat. So it's also good to know what's going on with amphibians for that reason. And so there are a lot of causes for why we're getting more and more extinct and threatened amphibian species. Um, a lot of it has to do with habitat change, but the next most important thing is things like pesticides and other chemicals that, that we put into the environment. And so that's where we're going to kind of focus on for the remainder of the talk. And so the, the chemicals that I'm thinking about in particular, we would also call them nutrients. And so these are things that actually naturally occur in the environment at low levels. So if we think about nitrogen, we have ammonium and nitrate and nitrite. These are all different forms of nitrogen and they are really important for different things that happen in the environment like breakdown of dead organisms, we help get nitrogen into the, the soil so the plants can use it so they can grow. And then similar thing with phosphorus too, right? We have phosphate that naturally occurs in the environment. It, it gets into the, um, it's in our rocks um, and soil. And so that's all fine and good, but we also have influx of both nitrogen and phosphorus from different things like applying fertilizer to our farms. And right, so New Jersey has a lot of farmland, right? We're the garden state. So we do use a lot of fertilizer in this state. Um, and then people like to use fertilizer for their gardens and their homes or to keep their lawn looking nice and beautiful. So we definitely have these in natural amounts and unnatural amounts in New Jersey. And so I just wanted to put up a few more pictures about nutrients. So the graph on the left-hand side, um, it shows basically this green line is showing how the population of humans has grown and really drastically increased in the last you know, several decades. But along with that, we see the use of fertilizer also increase very dramatically. So this blue represents the use of nitrogen fertilizer. And so you might think, well, you know, fertilizer is good. It helps us get more food and there are more people, so we need more food. Well, when we combine all of that extra nitrogen in with you know, increasingly warm temperatures, we get things happening that aren't so great. So there's this 
this process called eutrophication. And the, the short end of it is it really means that the algae grow, right? Algae are plants that just like our crop. They really like when we have all of this great fertilizer. But when there's a lot of algae and other plankton, then it reduces the amount of oxygen and we see fish die in large amounts. And so this has really been happening since the 70s. And you can see this really kind of lines up with where we start seeing like this big, you know, addition of nitrogen fertilizer in the environment. And so you might think, hey, fish dying, okay, that's not cool, but how does this have to do with frogs? Fair, fair question. Uh, so what, what has been found is that when we have additional fertilizer, it can have a lot of effects on different types of environment. So for example, when there's higher amounts of nitrogen, we also get higher amounts of trematodes, which is a type of parasite. And so you'll see these really high infections and things like snails and even frogs. And when frogs have a lot of parasites, they tend to then start to have, you know, developmental issues as well. So you have the nitrogen making the environment hard to breathe, right? And frogs breathe through their skin a lot of the time. So we have this, this difficulty in breathing, and then we have these infection rates that are going to cause additional limbs to grow. So there's, there's a lot of different uh, issues that can come with having these extra nutrients in the environment. Uh, and then there's also been research that has looked at some specific species of amphibians and shown that when you have more and more uh, nitrogen or phosphate in the environment, it affects the number of frogs that you find. So <laughs> there's a lot of frogs on this page. So I just wanted to kind of show you what this visually means. So if we have uh, a lot of phosphate and nitrate in the environment, then we see a loss of the number of species, but also the diversity of the species. And so we call that diversity, that biodiversity, we refer to as species richness. And then we also have the term species abundance. So in our population up here, the one I've labeled one, there are seven different frogs here. So it has a high abundance because there's a high number. Now in our population two, we have the same number. So the abundance is the same, but there's three different types of frogs going on here. So then we also have high species richness or high biodiversity. But then we can also have high species richness or high diversity, but also have low abundance, which means that although there are many types, there aren't many of each type. And so we see that when we have low levels of phosphate and nitrate, we have both high numbers and high diversity. Okay, so I promised you I would tell you a little bit more about the two leopard frogs that are found in New Jersey. And so this to me is, is uh, what really got me interested in studying the frogs of New Jersey. So there was a Rutgers student who graduated right before I came. And as part of his research, he actually discovered the fact that there was another species of frog, which he named the Atlantic Coast leopard frog. And so he found this when he was researching frogs on Staten Island. So we think of finding new species in places like the Amazon or places that are like very nice and warm and lots of, of rain. We don't think about finding new species in like an urban jungle, right? Where there's tons of people, lots of pollution, lots of trash, but that is exactly what happened. And so, the reason it took so long, it took till 2014 for someone to realize that this was a different species is because it looks very similar to the southern leopard frog. So you can see when they're held up next to each other, even though we know that they're different, they still are very similar. But you might notice that the Atlantic Coast leopard frog, the snout is more rounded compared to the southern leopard frog. But if you actually, so, so you could, if you see them from the front, you might can notice that. But the easiest way to me to determine the difference is to actually look at their hind legs. So this Atlantic Coast leopard frog has a very dark coloration and then it has like light spots. 
whereas the southern leopard frog is mostly white with dark spots on the hind leg. And so if you look at this map, you can see that the, sub, the southern leopard frog is represented by this kind of pink color. And it turns out that they thought that what is purple used to be pink, but now we know that that purple represents Atlantic Coast leopard frog. So you can see how their range comes right up next to each other. And so that kind of contributed to difficulty in realizing that there was this new species of frog. And so also in this map, there's some areas that are grayed out. And so those are areas where they think that the Atlantic Coast leopard frog used to live but now it no longer is there. So localized extinction. So that's another really um, big reason why it's important to research this species because we didn't know that it was unique originally. So we, we don't have a lot of information about it, but also we think it might be in decline. So we need to, to gather that information so we can conserve it. So I wanted to look to see if there really was an effect of nutrients on this species um, so that we could help try to find more populations of it. So my question was, does ammonium, phosphate, and nitrate differ between locations where we find the Atlantic Coast leopard frog and where we think it should be, but it isn't? And so I thought, like I read in those other studies, that in, in places where we find the frog, those, the amounts of nitrogen, phosphate, and ammonium would be lower than places where we don't find the frog. So how did I go about trying to answer this question? Well, I had to do a lot of field work. And so on the map are different sites that I visited in New York and New Jersey. Uh, and I went there looking for this species. Now, frogs are very hard to see, which you will maybe notice in the next few slides, but you can actually hear them when you can't see them. So I'd go, I'd listen, I'd collect water samples, and then I'd take those water samples back to the lab at Rutgers and analyze them to figure out how much of each nutrient was in each body of water that I visited. So let's see, what did, so this is a trip that I took to Island Beach State Park. So we know that there's southern leopard frogs there, but we thought there might be Atlantic coast leopard frogs there as well. Uh, we went to some other places. So this, this is what I found, not a frog, uh, but another amphibian uh, at one of my sites in New York. Um, this is Alamuchi, which is like Northwestern New Jersey. Very beautiful. This site had other species of frog, but not the frog that I was looking for. So it's a lot of trial and error. We look for a lot of, a lot of plants that are similar um, to try to find like, you know, same conditions. Uh, and then we also would look for tadpoles um, to confirm the presence or absence if we didn't hear them in a location. And so we would drag me and some of my undergraduate students would, you know, look for these tadpoles, sometimes we find them, sometimes we would catch frogs in our nets. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of the process for finding these frogs. And so uh, sometimes they are hard to see. I don't know if you all can tell, but there is actually a frog in this picture. Um, right here, you might see some spots that are on the leg and you might see this line to outline the body and the top of their eyes and a little bit of their snout. So that's a wood frog hiding in the grass. Um, but I'm gonna stop sharing the presentation really quickly because I wanna play for you, um, I want to play for you all what we were listening for. So I'm just gonna reshare, but this time with sound. So this is uh, a professional recording that I'll play for you. And so you can kind of hear that, I mean, I would describe it kind of as a duck sound almost. 
Um, that's how I kind of think about it. So that's what that's what the professionals are able to, you know, collect when they were out in the field. So it's very clear and crisp what you're listening for. But I'm gonna try to play for you all um, a recording of what I was listening to, and there. There is a wood, uh, sorry, uh, an Atlantic Coast leopard frog calling, but it's a little difficult to hear. So see if you can hear it. So I know this is a webinar, so I can't necessarily get feedback, but what I'm assuming you mostly heard was a very high pitch sound. So that was those spring peepers, but actually on you know a different wavelength, like very low and quiet, you could hear that same kind of duck sound kind of more off in the distance. So the spring peepers, you know, they were very close to where we were recording. They were in very high numbers, that high abundance that we talked about. Uh, and so our recording equipment right picked up on that really nicely, but it was a little hard to get recordings of the Atlantic Coast leopard frog when we were out, but I do promise it was there, even if you didn't quite catch it, it's a little difficult to hear. So let's uh, continue with the, the slideshow and see uh, how things panned out. So I told you that the two chemicals that I was thinking about are nutrients were um, ammonium, nitrate and phosphate. So we'll start with ammonia. So this is one of our nitrogen pollutants. And so I went out three different times. And so in all of the graphs, the, the dark colors are places that I visited that had the Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog. And the ones that are white, which just an outline, are sites that I visited that didn't have the Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog. And so looking at this, you know, there's a lot of variation. Um, but once I did some calculations, I realized that these really aren't different. So there wasn't any difference in the levels of ammonia. And so then I did the same thing for nitrate. And so same thing places with and without. And even though this looks quite different mathematically, they weren't considered to be different. So I was like, oh man, that's really disappointing all this work and doesn't seem to be any difference. Then I got to phosphate. And so you might think, well, this graph looks just like the rest of them, but it turns out that there actually was a difference in phosphate uh, when it came to the second half of the year. So in you know, mid-summer, it actually turned out that my hypothesis was correct. Uh, there were lower amounts of phosphate at places where we found the Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog when compared to places where it wasn't found. And then in a strange turn of events, it was actually the opposite result uh, when we went back in October. So in October, it actually had changed dramatically. So places where the frog was found were higher uh, than the places where the frog wasn't found. Uh, so very interesting result, at least to me, um, some of what I thought and some of what I didn't think. And so what does all of this mean going forward? Um, well, I thought this, this second half or this last visit was really interesting. So it turns out um, that frogs don't stay in the water all the time. So some species, right, we know some species do hibernate. Uh, and so they will actually leave the, the pond where they breed and hibernate somewhere else. So it's possible that they are leaving these sites. It's also possible that it's really more a fluctuation of the sites that they're not using that's driving um, the presence or absence, right? So because it went to be this high amount of phosphate you know, during the summer, even though it might have gotten to a place where they're okay with it, it's not consistently low phosphate. And so maybe that's why they don't um, use those particular wetlands or ponds or habitats. Um, so they didn't have any real response to nitrate or ammonium. So it's possible also that this species just isn't 
um, as sensitive. So I told you that the bullfrog, right? If we go back, let's see, the bullfrog is really big and it's also, you know, not very sensitive at all. Same thing with green frogs. They are just found everywhere and they really don't care. And actually the Southern leopard frog seems to be pretty hardy. We find that frog in a lot of places that we don't think it should like to be. So it's possible that, you know, this group of frogs that we find in New Jersey, these rannids, they're actually just, you know, hardier frogs. Um, and maybe something like the pine barrens tree frog, maybe if I were to have used that as my study species, you know, maybe I would have gotten more dramatic results, for example. Um, but basically, those are my main takeaways. Uh, and so I will end it there and see if you all have any questions. Okay, I see there are quite a few. Okay, so I can start at the top. So the first question I see is, how long is a frog's tongue? So you all made the craft with the frog tongue and it actually turns out that frog tongues, although they seem long, really don't measure to be that long. So they're about one third of the frog's body. So if a frog only grows to be three inches long, their tongue is really only one inch. But if we were to think about what that really means, like as far as a human, so I'm very close to six feet tall. So if my tongue was a third of my height, my tongue would be two feet long. So, <laughs> so it might not actually measure very long, but the ratio is actually quite uh, impressive. Okay, I see that Philip would like to know if I have a favorite type of frog. So I would say I don't have a favorite type, but maybe a category. So I think that poison dart frogs are very cool, but there's actually multiple species that fall into that category. So they're very brightly colored because they are some of those frogs that, that take the toxin um, from their food. So poison dart frogs eat an ant that has a toxin in its body and they've evolved to be able um, to eat those ants and not have the negative impacts. And I just think that just seems so cool. Plus they're very pretty. Like some of them have, you know, these beautiful blue lines and spots and I don't know, I just think they're great. Um, and I apologize if I mispronounced this name, but I think it's Sitara would like to know how many different types of frog species are in the world. So it's definitely over 5,000. Um, most of them are going to be found in, you know, the warmer regions of the world. So if you think Central America, Brazil, um, some parts of, you know, Asia, like Southeast Asia, places like that with very warm, wet climates is where you're going to find most of those species. Um, so, you know, New Jersey, it's not a tropical rainforest, so we only have 18. Um, how did I know that I wanted to study frogs? I didn't actually. So I, um, when I was a college student, I was really interested in turtles. And I did my master's and I couldn't work with reptiles um, just because logistics. Uh, so I had to pick something else. And I picked actually what's called a water flea. So it's an aquatic bug. And that's what I studied. And that's where I learned about, you know, man-made chemicals and how they impact the environment. I did some work with phosphate and some other um, pesticides and did research on that. And so then when I came to Rutgers, I got the opportunity to pick what I was going to learn uh, or study and do research on. And so I, I wanted to do turtles, but then I realized that, you know, turtles aren't that easy to study in the, in the area that I'm in. So, I mean, that makes it really great uh, if you are able to do it because there's not as much research out there, but for the time constraints of a PhD, I thought, 
you know, I'm going to pick something that has a shorter lifespan. So that's how I, I decided on frogs because they, they still were aquatic, um, but they were just a little easier to work with. Um, Philip would also like to know how high can the average frog jump? Okay, so uh, it depends on the frog, um, but they can jump, you know, about 10 times their um, height. So if you were to think about that and in, in, in how far could a human jump? Uh, so like I said, I'm I'm very close to six feet. So that means that if I were to jump like a frog, I would be jumping 60 feet high. So that's pretty impressive, right? You think about basketball players and they when they dunk, we're impressed by that. And that's not nearly as high as 60 feet, right? So Connie wants to know, are frogs social creatures? So I would say, um, in the way that we think about like people being social and dolphins being social, I would say not so much. Um, they do have some social interactions, right? Because they do, you know, reproduce. And so to reproduce, the males have to, you know, have some social interaction with the females. Um, but otherwise, they do spend a lot of time independent, hibernating looking for food. Um, you know, sometimes different species will eat other species of frogs. So uh, they tend to not try to stay around other frogs. So that way they don't become food for their neighbor, especially when they're tadpoles. Um, those bullfrog tadpoles uh, will eat other tadpoles. Actually, funny story. So when I was an undergrad, I took a herpetology class and so one night we went out to collect frogs. And so we caught all the different, or we were trying to find all the different frog species in Pennsylvania. And so we got a whole bunch and, you know, we just had these buckets and we were putting frogs wherever the nearest bucket was. And, but we were also like writing down what we found. And so um, I believe we had caught, I want to say an American toad or Fowler's toad. They can be really big. Um, or not really big, but they can be relatively large, like several inches as adults. But when they first hatch in toadlet, they're actually, you know, pretty small, not quite as small as the smallest frog, um, but the toadlets are, you know, maybe, you know, they're like maybe half an inch. So we had a few little frogs and then we also caught some bullfrogs. Well, by the time we had gotten back to the classroom to look at everything in the light, because we did this at night, we noticed that there were some frogs missing from the bucket that had the bullfrog. And so we concluded that the bullfrog had started eating the other frogs that were in the bucket. Um, so yeah, they tend to not stay around each other. That way they don't become food. How much water can a frog take before it drowns? I would say I haven't actually ever heard of a frog drowning because they're aquatic. So just like you wouldn't really think of a fish drowning, right? They have these mechanisms so that they are able to survive, you know, theoretically indefinitely in the water. They, they leave the water for other reasons, right? To hibernate, um, things like that. But I don't, I don't think that the frog could drown. And actually there are some species of frogs and salamanders that never leave the lake. Like there's, um, there's a frog called the African clawed frog and so it's fully aquatic. It doesn't, it doesn't go on land at all. And some of those like lungless salamanders that you might have uh, mentioned in the trivia, I don't think they leave the, the water either. If they do, it's only for very short periods of time. How old are frogs evolutionarily? That's a really good question. Um, frogs are actually pretty, pretty old. Um, they date back to over 300 million years ago. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, they've been here in existence for quite a long time. Okay, Ria's mom wants to know, have I ever seen any snakes in New Jersey while searching for frogs during my field work? Yes, I've seen quite a few frogs and actually they're, I mean, sorry, so a lot of snakes. 
actually there have been instances where I was so focused on what I was doing, I didn't realize I was about to step on a snake until it moved to get away from me. So yes, uh, I do see a lot of them, but I've never seen one that's poisonous. In fact, I'm not, I, I don't study snakes, so I'm not sure if this is true, but I'm not sure if there are poisonous snakes in New Jersey or not. That would be an interesting thing to look up. Um, I know in Maryland, which is where I'm from, there are poisonous snakes, um, but I haven't seen any of this, the same species that I would be avoiding in Maryland when I've been out, um, mostly just green snakes, black snakes. Um, yeah, nothing that would hurt. Okay, Ashley would like to know, do frogs go through rumination like reptiles? And if they do, does the duration, oops, I can't quite read that. Does the duration vary? Okay, so because frogs are um, cold blooded, um, they do kind of have that process of, um, you know, getting very still. I'm not sure if the same word is used to describe that behavior, but they do have that similar behavior. Um, so frogs are really cool because they, their physiology, so like the inside of their body has some really cool evolutionary things that have happened. And so they can actually slow their body down very, very low because they're in these really cold bodies of water or underground when it's freezing. Um, and so when they get into that state, they are, you know, hibernating, right? So they're not really moving. Um, so that's the extreme. But also on just like cold days in the summer, you're also going to notice that they're, they're not going to be moving around a lot either. How long does a frog stay out of the water before it needs to go back? That is a, also a very good question. Um, I would say it depends. I would say I don't have an exact number, but I know that it's not for, um, for some species, it's not going to be very long. So, you know how we talked about the difference between true between the frogs versus the tree frogs versus the toads, right? So the toads and a lot of the tree frogs can actually stay out of the water for quite a while, right? So the, the spadefoot toads, they spend most of their time out of the water. So we're talking days, weeks, months at a time, right? Because they're able to get some of that moisture out of the soil, actually. But then other frogs, like I said, some are fully aquatic, so they really can't ever leave. Um, but then some of our frogs, you know, like the ones that I study, they're not going to stay out of the water for like weeks on end, right? They, they spend more of their time hibernating actually in the lake. So I know that wasn't a specific answer, but it really is, you know, species dependent. To know what was the most unusual frog I've observed or worked with? Hmm, that's a good question. I would say I feel like the frogs that I work with are actually like pretty common. So I'm not sure if I have a specific answer with as far as worked with, but one of a, a student in my department, she has since graduated, she worked with the poison dart frogs. And so um, she would breed them to raise money for her research. And so before the pandemic, when I had, you know, a desk on campus and went in every day to work, I got to share um, my desk space with her poison dart frogs, which I thought was really fun. Um, I would say the most unusual amphibian though that I have worked with um, was called a hellbender. So that's the common name for the salamander and it's actually pretty big. So what we were, I, I caught, it, caught some for my class and then I also worked with the Pennsylvania Fish and Wildlife Service um, because they are, I believe they're endangered in Pennsylvania. I'm not sure if they're endangered everywhere, um, but they are really, they can grow to be several feet long, not quite, not six feet, but like two or three feet long. And so people used to kill them because they are afraid of them and they didn't know that, you know, like this, this creature is not gonna harm you. It's good for the environment. It, it shows that your environment's healthy. It's a very sensitive species, um, but I thought they were very cool. They are huge. Um, but they are, they are very cool. They, they have a very specific diet. They pretty much just eat crawfish. 
um, which is probably also part of why uh, they are declining because they, they, they don't just eat anything that you put in front of them. Uh, what's the best place to find a frog around New Brunswick? And is there a particular time they are most active? So um, I would say probably most, place, most bodies of water <laughs> you're going to find frogs. Um, I know on Rutgers campus, there's Passion Puddle and there are definitely, um, I believe it's green frogs that are there. There are tree frogs. I think they're the, um, I think they're the gray tree frogs and not folks that are in Donaldson Park along with green frogs. Uh, and then Johnson Park has an insane number of bullfrogs, um, especially, so I don't know if you all are familiar with Johnson Park, but there's an area that's kind of like gated off. Um, if you ever like walk over near that area at night, so they're most, all of the frogs are mostly active at night. Um, you will hear lots and lots and lots of bullfrogs. And so when I was doing some other study, another study, we had permission to be there like after hours. And, and so we were exploring in that area and there were just so many bullfrogs at that little pond that it was like, it was hard to just walk around without accidentally stepping on a bullfrog. There were just so many of them. Um, so I thought that was pretty crazy. Um, let's see, where are we on the list of questions? Uh, what has gone wrong during field work? Ah, that is a good question. I've gotten a lot of flat tires. So that, that uh, cause you know, some off-roading does occur occasionally. Um, but I would say, um, you know, there's the normal things like, oh, there's a lot of mosquitoes out today, or I ran into a really prickly bush and now I have thorns all over me. Um, but actually the first night that I went out with my undergraduate, uh, there was just a man in the park and we actually thought that this man was like a corpse. So that was kind of crazy. It turned out they were not, they were just, you know, breaking the law. That's all, that's all. Um, but it definitely was an odd start to drive up and see like a person laying on the ground and not move at all when the car lights like shine on, on his body. Um, so that was, that was always, you know, a very interesting situation. Nothing bad happened or anything like that. And we like called the paramedics, but the guy like ended up leaving before they got there just to like make sure he was okay. Um, but yeah, that was like my first night doing research. So it was kind of kind of uh, a little nerve wracking. But after that, everything, like everything else went pretty much smoothly. And then Lauren wants to know, is it true frogs can survive being frozen? So they can serve, I would say they can survive fr freezing temperatures. So um, that's what I was kind of like alluding to before. So their physiology, like they have the ability um, to not freeze, even though the temperature might be below freezing. So other animals would eventually freeze, but they're not going to. Do frogs make good pets? I'd say if you uh, are responsible enough to take care of them, sure, why not? Um, they don't require a lot of feeding. You don't have to change the water a lot. Um, you know, they're pretty cute. So I'd say, sure, they could be a great pet. Pet, I would say, make sure you get them from like a pet store. And if you get one, definitely keep it and don't release it into the wild, especially if it's not a species that's from um, the United States, because that can, uh, that can have, you know, negative impacts to the environment. Um, next question, do we have salamanders, newts, and Sicilians in New Jersey? So newts are a type of salamander. I'm not sure if we have newts specifically. I know there are several species of New Jersey, um, but I don't study them. So I'm not up to date on the exact species because when I did all of my learning of the species, I was in Pennsylvania. So I, I know what species are in Pennsylvania. I'm, it's very similar, but I'm not, I, there, I would have, I, Maybe we can look that up really quick. New Jersey salamanders. Okay, so if you are interested in the different species, uh, the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife actually has like a lot of great information where you can listen to like what they sound like when they call, 
Um, you can see pictures and you know just get general information about where in the state you can find them. Okay, ah, haha, I should have known this. So remember that picture that I showed you earlier? I was like, oh, we found this little salamander on our walk. That's the red spotted newt. So yes, you do have newts in, uh, in New Jersey, um, but I believe that is the only one. The rest of them are just, you know, your standard uh, salamanders. So we have like the marbled salamander, we have the blue spotted salamander, uh, the dusky salamander. Some of those, you find those in Pennsylvania too, which makes sense. They're very close to each other. Uh, we don't have Sicilians in New Jersey. So Sicilians are mostly just found where it's really warm. Um, they mostly live underground. Um, and yeah, we find them in like Africa and I think a little bit in um, Asia and maybe also in like Central South America, like Northern South America. And that's kind of, you know, around the equator. That's where our Sicilians are mostly found. So unfortunately, we don't have Sicilians in New Jersey. And because of that, because they're only found in the tropics, really, um, they're really understudied. Like you think about the, the Atlantic Coast leopard frogs and how, you know, we're trying to find out information about it, but we're like actively trying to find out information. There's so many species of, of Sicilians that because they don't live in the areas where a lot of this research is going on, they're actually like data, what we call data poor. Like we really need to get a lot more information about them because um, we just we just don't have a lot of scientists who are thinking about them. And then the last question that I see is when I went to Island Beach State Park, was I looking for amphibians in the marsh or on the sandy beach? That's a good question. So um, I was looking for them not in the actual like bay, so I was on the bay side. So I wasn't really looking for them in the bay. But before you get to the bay, there are these little pockets of wetlands. Um, and so I was looking for them in that beachy area before you get to the water. So you, the, the park has a lot of like pitch pines and other um, foresty kind of species that are on that, that, that island or in the park, I should say. And so there are frogs that are out there in the park. It turns out that they're southern leopard frogs and not Atlantic coast leopard frogs. So it was a good hypothesis that they were out there, but it just turned out that we were just off ever so slightly. So it was southern leopard frogs. Um, so there's there are trails that you can walk through, like I said, going towards like the bay side and not the ocean side. And sometimes you'll hear um, the southern leopard frogs calling out. Are there any other last questions? No, I think you got all of the questions. So thank you so much, Lena, and thank you to our audience. Those were really great questions and thank you for joining us today. Um, and actually stay tuned for our next event, which is actually going to be a paint along event and it'll be virtual. Um, and so you can join us and that'll be on March 30th and it'll be starting at 6 p.m. Uh, we will have a guided painting session and it's going to be a lot of fun so feel uh, free to mark that on your calendars and uh, please join us on march 30th at 6 p.m uh, and once again thank you lena for for this talk it was really interesting and thank you everyone and good night